I think what Jorn's referring to, I was lucky enough to get very involved in helping set up national parks and wildlife well, refuges all over the world. So I did a lot of work in uh, the Amazonian uh, basin uh, and all over uh, Asia. And of course, during those times, I was able to live and uh, learn from many, many of the indigenous peoples of these different parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> as a result, um, several things took place. One was I was help, able to help a number of areas get preserved as, as large reserves for the indigenous peoples. Uh, one of the biggest was, I think, a three million hectare reserve in the uh, Peruvian Upper Amazonian watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, also worked extensively in Nepal and along the border with Tibet and got to hire many Tibetans who became, uh, we had moving villages going through the mountains, helping set up national parks like Sagamata at uh, Mount Everest. Sagamata is the local name. And uh, at uh, beautiful valley called Langton, which is considered to be one of the hidden secret valleys that has a, its own physical presence, but uh, invisible to our eyes, another level of existence, which was very sacred to the mountain people of that part of the world. Um, <clears throat> kind of a small scale Shangri-La type of place. Mm -hmm. And um, we're pretty heavily down in the lowlands near the birthplace of the Buddha, a place called, um, uh, actually several places. One was a national park in Indian adjacent, um, and then a national park for the rhino and the tiger, mm -hmm. which I helped to get established, expanded. Uh, so as a result of this blessing of being able to travel and live in many of these different parts of the world, I would often apprentice myself to the local shamans and teachers and uh, learn what I could from them. I had a passion for uh, finding cultures and peoples that had developed in their culture a way of deep connection to nature because I saw early on that the lack of connectivity to nature was the root cause of most of the imbalances we see today. And. Uh, so I was very interested in cultures that had somehow been able to have that, and then through the connectivity with, with their local ecosystem and Mother Earth overall, to establish cultures that lived in relative harmony and balance with uh, the big family of life, as I like to call it. <clears throat> so it was a great gift for me mm -hmm. to learn from these great cultures, from Tibet to many of the Native American cultures in, in America. And um, over time, slowly, so I began to see that there was a common ground between these great traditions of nature connected culture. And my own culture was way out of balance, obviously, so I, I could see early on that we had, have had some real problems in, in the West, in the modern emergent uh, contemporary urban industrial type of culture. And I think for the same reason I began to, early on, I, I for some reason I, I knew this was an important path. So when I was very young, age five, I began asking my hmm. grandparents and parents to, we lived in a farm up in northern New Hampshire in the White Mountains. And um, asked them if I could go out and be with the big, the big family in the big church, which was the forest surrounding our mountain farm. Hmm. Uh, my family operated in a pretty traditional way. They planted, uh, I just went back for a visit actually a few weeks ago. Yeah. And we used to plant with a dig stick, a pointed stick at the end of us, something like a spear. And we would bring down that into the earth as a, as a kid. And that was bringing the heaven energy into the, into the earth to join with the earth. Then we would bend it to the four directions, to invoke the positive energies of north, south, east, west, and so on. <clears throat> um, and then one of the kids would plant a little kernel of corn and bean 
and uh, then nearby some squash. It was called the Three Sisters. Yeah. And we didn't plow the earth because we never, we were taught never to rip open the body of Mother Earth. You bring in a, bring in the energy in a sacred way through the zinc sink. Yes. And then as the stick came out of the earth, Mother Earth's energy would flow up into the little hole. Yep. And then the, those energies would fuse with the corn, the bean, and the squash. And the three sisters would grow and flourish. By the way, the corn comes up, provides a beautiful support for the bean, and the bean benefits from the nitrogen of the corn. So the corn needs the nitrogen, and um, the bean needs the support of the corn plant. So they, they were in a cooperative, collaborative relationship. And that taught me early on that all of us depend on each other <clears throat> mm. in living in relationship and, and contributing to the big family of life. And the squash is, is yeah. shadowing, right? And the squash comes in as kind of a representative really of the sacred feminine. Yep. Uh, mm. So I think how we uh, did our agriculture in the early days played an important role in, in uh, we're also raised, by the way, with no electricity, <coughs> no telephone, no microphones, <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, no electricity, no telephone. And we had a spring near the farmhouse, and we'd go over to the spring and carry water, buckets of water back to the farmhouse. So it was a simple life. We had a, you probably all have heard the term icebox. Yep. We had an icebox and we would go down to the lake in the winter period, cut the ice out of the lake. Maybe you used to do that here in Sweden. And then we'd carry the ice with tongs into a wagon and then the horse drawn wagon would carry it up to the farm. And we would store it in, uh, there was a nearby little sawmill. And we would take the sawdust from the sawmill and then put the blocks of ice yeah. in the uh, sawdust. Yeah. And it was amazing how long that ice would last into the summer. Yeah. And then in the ice box, you could have a slab of ice like this in a pan underneath to catch it as it slowly melted against the water. And it served pretty well if we could get it to last for three or four days. And uh, that was our refrigeration system. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have electricity until I was about 16. And same with telephone. And then we had a party line. <laughs> a very bonding community enterprise. <laughs> because everybody knew everybody else's business and what was going on. Um, <clears throat> so it was a nice, simple way to grow up. But I think that it probably had some influence. And I remember asking my parents and grandparents, because we had aunts and uncles and the kids from my immediate family all growing up together as a big family and tribe, my grandparents used to say. And uh, so I asked them if I could go out into the real church and spend some time with, with the family of the big community, uh, the family of life. And they said, well, son, grandson, you're a little young yet, you might want to wait a bit. So at six, I asked again, they said, well, you're almost there, but be patient. And finally at age seven, they said, okay, it's time. And so I went out into the woods and did my first, uh, my first vision quest. And in a classical vision quest, there's no food, no or very little water, no clothing, no shelter, and no sleep. A small circle of eight or nine feet. And then you have sacred plants like tobacco and sage and sweet grass, which are sometimes tied in a certain way to, to market a natural mandala that you inhabit. I didn't know about that part in those days. Later on, I incorporated it, but, so I went out very simple and my sacred circle was where my senses uh, lived. So when you're in the forest, you can see not that far really. And, um, I remember being impressed by how there's a natural circle of what I could hear, what I could see, what I could touch, and um, what I could taste and smell. And then, of course, I could only move within a small, that small circle. And uh, 
and that had the experience of movement and balance as another experience. And then, of course, the, uh, I began to sense my own life force, the chi, the prana. And that was another expression within the natural mandala of my senses. And slowly, slowly, I began to, as I went out as that young kid of seven years old, I began to have that feeling of being part of a natural mandala provided by the perceptions, or the experiential fields, as I now call them. And now we work with the same thing, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, movement and balance, the experience of the life force, and then of course the display of the thoughts and the emotions that dance through our, our minds. And all that arose from a very natural uh, ground of being, pure being, pure awareness, pure consciousness, which uh, was quite natural in the, in the early days of my, my life. And uh, then it began, you, we all begin to lose that once we start to enter into culture and the responsibilities and activities of an adult life. But I never forgot that pure level of pure beingness, which was there in the very beginning as the gift we all have. But we forget about it. And um, <clears throat> so as I began to get older, I began taking out a few members of my family in a sacred way, like that. And I felt during that time, and then later on when I began to share it, that uh, the big, one of the biggest gifts was realizing that I was profoundly connected to this big family of the trees, the plants, the animals, the elements of the earth, and stones and water and trees and the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, all the beings that my senses were connecting to. And I began to have the experience of the senses being a bridge that connected myself internally and in inner, my inner nature to this amazing display of outer nature. And I began to bond with it. And so instead of being a, having the senses define I'm here and that is there, it became a bridge that allowed me to go into deeper and deeper states of connection. And so I began to have the experience of what I would call today natural communion. Natural communion means, if I understand the Latin right, with union. Mm. So the experience of the senses providing the experience of being profoundly connected unified even, while at the same time being my own individuated being. And as I went deep into that experience, I began to notice that there was a fundamental unity there that was beyond even uh, any kind of duality. And, uh, <clears throat> and then later I began to notice that even that experience of unity began to arise out of this vast field of pure beingness, pure consciousness, pure awareness. At that point, the entire process of the quest became extremely liberating because I was resting in a, a formless state of pure beingness that, uh, out of which we all arise, all our experiences arise, back into which it returns moment by moment. So that was uh, age seven. And uh, then I began to share it. I remember I had one friend who was a motorcycle guy. Butch was his name, good, good guy. And we used to go out to uh, different places and, and I shared the process with him and then a few other people began to become interested and I began to share it with them. Before I knew it, I had a little tribe. I guess these days we call it a little gang. <laughs> but the price of membership was not to go out and, and raise a ruckus or rob steel or sell drugs or anything like that, it was too do the quest, do the vision quest. And because we all shifted so profoundly in that, in that experience, it became very clear to me early on that, that this was a, a way that could be shared and it was following actually the ancient, I discovered later these ancient indigenous pathways of how they bonded with nature and why they became so profoundly ecological in their way of relating to the family of life just through this simple practice. And so I began to share it more and more widely and then got involved with, um, in college with 
uh, studying this strange thing that nobody knew anything about. This is in the late 50s, called ecology. Ecos means, of course, like, again, family or household, uh, the household of life. <coughs> but in those days, it was not really known that much as a science. It was just getting started. I remember I went to the University of Michigan because it was the only place I could find that had some professors that were able to teach this. And I particularly was interested in the system of life, you know, the family, the big family, how does it work? And um, how would it fit into the experience I had? Already was deeply immersed in of the, of the quests. So um, I remember sharing with people who asked me what I'm doing in school. And I'd say, well, I'm studying to be an ecologist. And they say, what is that? Is that that must be the study of bugs, right? <laughs> Entomology, that was as close as they could come in those days. Uh, hard to imagine today, because ecology, I think, is pretty well known as a science, mm -hmm. much less ecosystem ecology, which is the science of the system of life. So uh, over time, uh, the personal spiritual development and the ecosystem ecology scientific development kind of fused in me and I began following a, a pathway that unified both the spiritual and the scientific, ecological and, uh, and uh, spiritual. And the spiritual provide the experiential foundation for what scientifically was being verified through the science of ecology, especially ecosystem ecology mm -hmm. and the study of the biosphere of the entire planet and how it behaves as a, as a vast system of life and more recently then we begin to get insights that confirm the ancient uh, insight that the earth itself was sentient and had its own consciousness its own way of being its own integrity and if you add up all the rights of nature which are many of us are engaged in now the totality of those rights is the rights of mother earth and what uh, she deserves in terms of our relationship to her. So uh, science and ecology came together, uh, science and ecology and spirituality came together in a very natural way, just through my, my own life experience. Uh, so I got involved, as you mentioned, Jorn, with helping bring that, some of these insights in a broader way and discovered that um, uh, most of our behavior tend to be as a species that mostly took from nature, called it a resource, mineral resources. I went to the school of natural resources, mineral resources, <laughs> forestry resources, soil resources, uh, uh, different kinds of mineral resources, on and on and on, all meaning what we could take from nature and use for ourselves. And I began to ask the question, well, what are we giving back? And mostly what we're giving back was our refuse. And uh, often not in a very healthy state because much of it was chemicalized and were in unnatural forms that were, it was hard for nature to digest and absorb, unlike most species. So <clears throat> out of that, uh, with my, one of my early jobs with, with a group called the Conservation Foundation, which later merged with the World Wildlife Fund and became much better known. Um, but I never forget that experience of how we were out of relationship with the big family of life. So I began to uh, take a look at, uh, well, how could we language? And language is amazing because it it frames our consensual realities, right? Within the linguistic frame, even as we are sharing today, that language frames our consciousness and how we perceive things. So I began to think, maybe we need some language that's better than resources and just a taker mentality. Um, if any of you have read the book Ishmael, that goes into that problem, that issue very deeply came out in a movie called Instinct with Anthony Hopkins, really profound movie. 
Yeah. Hard to find, by the way. Yeah, I know. Because they've almost banned it from, from the internet. Maybe it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so I thought, well, what's the common word that describes whole systems? And the best, it's in common usage. And the best I could find was environment. Because it describes a whole system in a common language that anybody can kind of comprehend. So we I've introduced this book that Jorn shared, The Future Environments. That was a gathering of leaders, cultural leaders from around the world, with the emphasis on North America as a start, plan then to actually do that for other areas. And uh, it basically brought the term environment into popular usage as a replacement for this human bias system of just resources and taking. And fortunately, it was the right idea at the right time. It caught on and grew and flourished and the environmental movement birthed itself and all kinds of people came in and fired it up and, and the rest became the history, became history of the environmental movement, which is still going on. Um, I think I just happened to be at the right place at the right time to help something come through. Um, as we, as that movement began to grow and flourish, I also got involved with something called um, the uh, Environmental Policy Act. We felt that it was important to be able to take a look at the impacts of our actions in a comprehensive way and have some system before we do something to go and take a look at what the results of that action might be as a people. And that eventually became codified in something called the Environmental Policy Act, which is in our country, the US, established EPA and uh, environmental review process. I think that's picked up by many other countries now. Mm -hmm. But the problem we had with, uh, with that was the environmental review, review process was housed in the same agency that was doing the uh, proposed project. Mm -hmm. So it was not really what we had originally recommended was an independent review that was not biased. Mm -hmm. So we still have some work to do to improve those acts. <clears throat> um, so long story short, the environmental movement got legs. Legislation was passed. I was somewhat involved with a fair bit of it, like the Environmental Policy Act, um, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, and so on. It was, again, a time when we could pass legislation like that today it would be almost impossible. So um, things are so polarized. In those days, there was not the big uh, separation between, in, in my country, the Republican and the Democratic parties or independent people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was possible to do a lot. And uh, then the as this was happening, uh, I remember towards the end of the 70s, when we made quite a bit of progress, a guy named Jimmy Carter was in office in the States, and we actually got renewables that were beginning to, to move, solar, wind, hydro, and so on, mini hydro. And then a guy named Ronald Reagan came into power, and he immediately took the panels off the White, White House. House and began to reverse every single environmental initiative that we had put in place in the 70s, the 60s. Systematic destruction of the nascent environmental movement. Systematic. And I realized that we had a real problem. And I also realized how temporary uh, what is very good legislation really was. And uh, that we needed a much stronger, more powerful cultural foundation for if we were really going to rejoin the family of life. So I began to shift more and more energy and time towards building out um, the early work of vision questing that I had done as a kid and then shared with friends and family members later on. And, uh, and out of that came uh, what I initially called the nature quest process. And then later on, a more extended one that was two weeks long called Sacred Passage. And there are three parts of it, the awareness training in the beginning, the uh, deep 
dive into solitude in nature, in the middle part, and then the coming out to honor the creativity and the insight that was received during the first two parts. And uh, that process, uh, Brian later on formalized into uh, the three parts of the three U. We've since then, by the way, made it into a five-step process. The first part is when you decide you're gonna do this crazy thing called a sacred passage or a nation quest, and you set your intent to do that. Immediately your shadow stuff comes up that says, I can't do that, I've got other things to do. I'm too busy, or this is too threatening, or maybe a me, or who knows what, it depends on your fears. And then, uh, so we added that in, and then some people get through it and arrive and actually go through the awareness training and the soul time in nature. And then the integration time and sharing time after you're all one time solo. But the fifth part was when you go back home and then you have to integrate what you've received and the creative gifts back into the nat natural flow of, of life. So now, our sacred passage is a nature quest. Actually put more emphasis on when you come back and how to integrate skillfully and how to deal with the shadows that have come up and, and appeared in your psyche. How do you really work with those skillfully? So the process has changed a bit over time. Um, so I began to shift into these wave nature, as we now call it the wave nature fellowship these way of nature programs, which uh, really have, in the training part, codified the common ground principles that most cultures seem to have on the path to becoming more liberated. And uh, most cultures had a rite of passage component during those periods of life of great transition, which uh, we kind of codified into the seven days of solitude that you you take a deep dive into. And uh, of course, most cultures had the mountain retreat. The forest dwellers had the deep immersion in the forests of South India. Uh, the Taoists and Tibetans had the mountain retreat. The Native Americans had the vision quest, but they all shared in common disconnecting from human culture for a little while. So you're free of the consensual realities dumped on you by culture and you are open, have more spacious to receive the teachings from your sisters and brothers in the world of the plants, the animals, the birds, and all the other beings of nature that surround you all the time, but normally you ignore. And um, you begin to receive tremendous insight from that. And um, so the, uh, these processes began to come together in a way that was kind of common ground. Uh, common ground in the sense that every culture practices certain ways of helping support connection and dropping away from your normal way of being so you can really hear and listen to the voice of nature. So I codified these principles into a series of the 12 that you were talking about. And uh, they seem to be shared in common by most enlightening, liberating cultures. And um, <clears throat> so I codified them. And originally it was only a few, three or four, and then slowly grew as I went deep into the process and began to ask for guidance, inner guidance, and what would be a complete common ground approach to these core principles. And what we ended up with was, was this, these 12, which you'll find in the two books that Yarn mentioned, if you're interested. Also on our website. Too. On the website as well. Yeah. yeah. So over time, I, it, many people have gone through this process now, maybe in the thousands. Mm -hmm. The invitation or the challenge to our species is to come back into harmony with us of life. We're way out of whack. We've ignored the basic rules of ecological connectivity and coherence and giving back as part of a big family and we would ignore the basic spiritual truth of a truly uh, culture, that can, a human species that can reconnect with our true nature. So we've both disconnected from the outer world of ecology and disconnected from the reality of this liberated essence within all of us, which is at the heart of 
the spark of our being. Um, so out of that uh, came a uh, the process we have today to reconnect with the three natures, outer nature, inner nature, which is that world of perceptions and experiences from birth to death that we all share, and true nature, which is the source level of being, which is our fundamental uh, beingness, our fundamental open, pure awareness, uh, inner silence, spaciousness, and uh, inner uh, peace. And then, of course, the uh, uh, that true nature aspect can only manifest when all the cacophony of uh, our shadows begins to lift or transform. <coughs> so we've been spending a lot of time the past four years developing a common ground approach to uh, addressing the shadow aspects that we all carry from through this birth to death experience. And the shadow aspects we've been working with again in a common ground way. We've identified how the shadows manifest at the level of the body, physically, how they show up in the in terms of the emotional body, how they show up in the energy body and the meridians and the chakras, how they show up in the 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 emotional body, which carries many of these shadow aspects as almost, they could almost a life of their own. And then how they show up in the mental patterns that we, that often initiate these shadow aspects. And then finally, uh, how does it work through the ancestral patterns that our families carry? And then how does it show up in terms of the, the uh, general cultural patterns and processes that we imbibe? from being even as a kid. And then finally, how does it show up in the karmic traces that we bring through from lifetime to lifetime? So those six levels of shadow manifestation became the focal point for the last four years of work, which is perfect for COVID. And I had a group of 30 or 40 people that journeyed with me in this exploration. <coughs> and we have developed seven techniques for transformation uh, that it, we could apply at those six levels of manifestation. And uh, what that does is kind of clear the, de the decks so that you can really make authentic connection to the outer world of life and the true nature aspect of your, the essence of your being. It's been quite a trip. <laughs> 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 so anyway, that's just a precursor for the 12 principles. <clears throat> what the teacher, Right? Um, one thing that we did together uh, uh, was to work with, we call it Pathfinders. And uh, we, because we, we also had a, a Zoom call recorded when we were talking about the, the need of, of bringing this out on a broader scale. Right. And I know there is some of you here in, in here that was attending in Telbay as path Pathfinders you know, bringing people out in, into that connection, even on a in kind, of, kind of international meeting where we have to start from another level than just uh, from the mind and really connect to the rest of life that we stand on and, and so. So what's, what, what, what's your idea or uh, thoughts on how we can brought or bring this out on the broader scale? Do you? Mm. Well, uh, one of the things I've been working with lately is having a concert. Yeah. Uh, I thought we all like concerts, like music, right? Music is magical. And uh, so I've been talking with a number of my associates who work in that field uh, about having a, a world simulcasted concert. Imagine if our species had an official concert where we apologize for our treatment of Mother Earth and emphasize the Thanksgiving concert uh, to honor Mother Earth and the rest of life. That'd be fantastic. And then have some globally known uh, stars participate like Beyonce and people of that sort. She wants to do a passage in my ear. Yes, so you know. <laughs> and then uh, really feed local musicians and local creativity that 
know how to relate to their local ecosystem better than anybody else and let the creativity flow from those local groups. And that would be the, hopefully the, the, the main body of the concert. It would be simulcasted roll around on a 24 hour cycle uh, with the natural cycles of the sun and the moon. And, um, and then have a day, maybe before and maybe after, where you go and do the practices of nature connectivity to honor the authentic connection with the rest of life and have, begin to look into that if you have had that experience. So a Thanksgiving concert like that would be a fantastic way to start and bring the music in that celebrates and honors and respects that big family of life. So I'd start with things like that. Yeah. What do you think about that? <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, one thought, um, when it comes to leaders, what, what is the most important thing that you can advise? Uh, we had a little bit uh, the, the circle around lunch. You were talking about uh, awareness and presence and so probably you can bring the w uh, not only leaders but we all are leaders i mean whatever situation we come into some w uh, it's give and take you know but what what is most important or is it something that we have to start with that you will will uh, um, give us advice oh yeah i would definitely uh recommend that you maybe learn some of these very simple practices of how to, to bond with nature and how to celebrate your nine experiential fields and refine them. And uh, fortunately we have some publications that help you do that if you'd like to explore that. Uh, but in addition I think it'd be really helpful for people to begin to find in their own area some places that are, feel very special which feel uh, like you can make a, a very deep connection to the family of life. And a place where you can go and be in solitude for a, for a bit of time. And begin going there on a daily basis, ideally. It could be a local park, it might be a, a neighborhood uh, green area, who knows? And it, it depends on you, what you feel is authentically special. And then go and learn how to do your own form of ceremony. We have a suggested interfaith old denominational ceremonial process we call the 11 direction ceremony which can give you a start and then you can make it your own um, <clears throat> it's not ceremony is not owned by any particular culture you and your intention your capacity to bring the power of intent to whatever ceremony you utilize in the power of prayer is the main thing in fact you really only have to have true love and appreciation and go into nature with that view and that's there's nothing more powerful as a ceremony than that. You don't have to go to some traditional culture and, and borrow it from them. You can just go direct and, and let it come through you, honestly, authentically from your heart. Uh, so we, if you find these special places, you can learn the, the approaches to being there in a way that allows you to be very relaxed and present. And you can learn to be completely open and relaxed, maybe with the flow of a stream supporting you, the movement of the wind over your body, uh, mastering the capacity to relax every single fiber of your being. So you let go of everything that blocks and sends the way of, of true connection. And then you can begin to explore pleasance by staying with the movement of the leaves and the trees or the flow of the stream and going deeper and deeper into being completely in the here now. And then you fuse relaxation and presence. You can't really be present unless you're relaxed. Relaxation has been greatly ignored by most presidents or even teachers. Bring the capacity and master the capacity to relax without falling asleep. Mm. That's where presence comes in. Presence sharpens things up, brings clarity. Relaxation brings openness and the capacity to truly connect with a lot of blockages in the way. So you fuse the two and that begins to open the door to true connectivity. And you can go through the sequence of being, oh, I'm, I'm really blocked, I'm disconnected. Hmm, I'm feeling like I'm beginning to connect now. 
wow, I can go deeper with that and actually experience communion where I'm naturally connected and also in a state of oneness while well, still being myself. Maybe going deeper into that and having experience of union where there's just the uniqueness of you and say the tree or the flower or the bird. And then you follow all of that back into the essence of yourself, so your true nature aspect, and then you, it begins to point out true source, open, formless, infinite, boundless, unborn, undying awareness, consciousness. And when that happens with many different things within your special spots you found in nature, you also realize there's a gigantic natural mandala or sacred circle of the family of life surrounding you as your companions for this journey. And um, so you can go into that sacred space and do these kinds of things and it becomes deeper and deeper. You become one with it. The sacredness of that space begins to open and you begin to enter a very different realm than the normal realm we have in our, our lives. Ultimately, as the true nature level of recognition deepens, then you actually can experience anywhere, anytime, any place in a sacred way. But that come, tends to come later. The toughest part, as I've uh, experienced, is to, re to surrender to what is. <clears throat> Do we have a choice? <laughs> <I> mean, <really. laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why get caught up in what is not? And if you're caught up in something that is not, that's still manifesting in the field of your true nature. Yeah. So it's still what is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Pretty simple. <laughs> mm. So, how do you feel? Silent. Inspired. Inspired. I have a question. Yeah. What if you're not, uh, if you if you can't go into the nature? For Sorry? some reason, if you if you, if you can't walk or you're sick or something, yeah. What do you do? Uh, you be with the truth of what is. Yeah. I had a stroke a few years back, back in the two thousand twelve, right? And I couldn't talk, I couldn't walk, and I couldn't move much of my body. And uh, I applied my training in qigong and tai chi, and energy cultivation and meditation to bring the life force back into the parts of the body that were paralyzed. And initially I, it took a lot of patience, but slowly, slowly, the nervous system began to recover and restore itself. And at each step in that stage, I still went out into nature, or I was carried out into nature in the beginning. First thing I told the hospital was take me outside, I want to be in the sunlight and have my bare feet on the earth, no rubber. And I grounded. And of course, as you know, connection to the earth and the grounding capacity of the earth is the number one reduction of inflammation in the human body, if you give yourself the chance to do that. Did you also know that when you go into the sun, the morning sun, the even if you're wearing clothing, the near-infrared goes through your clothing, uh, simulates the melatonin production in the uh, mitochondria, not for sleep but it stimulates the melatonin production by the mitochondria, which then acts as a cooling agent to cool down the mitochondria from their, their busy activity to provide the energy production for the cell. That morning sun with the near infrared is the key to having healthy mitochondria for the day. It also resets your, your, your cycle, your day-night cycle, so that you're, you're better prepared bodily to go to sleep well at night. But this is also living, we brought that in life, so this is not plastic, just so you know. This is <laughs> the other one are, but this is... <laughs> this is plastic? No, this it's is not. not. This no, is no, real. No, no. So it's, it's, it's also important, I mean, uh, to, to answer your question, you can also communi communicate with, with life as, uh, as a yeah. plant indoors. And I guess the main thing is, no matter what's going on, there's always a way of being in a natural connection with nature, where the outer, the inner, and the true nature can, can come together and be cultivated. Doesn't, it really doesn't matter. You could be, I was semi-paralyzed. I could barely, 
in the beginning had to be carried around. Yeah. It still worked. Yeah. And it's good to know these things from science about the connectivity with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the way in which your own body actually works. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to see how all these things, how science and spirituality come together and really harmonize with each other when you really go deep with it. And um, it's been one of the great things of my life is to see how science and spirituality really work as a team. What I admire with, with uh, you, John, is that you, you are a scientist. So, so your left brain is working pretty well <laughs> at the same time with the rest of, of the whole system, mm -hmm. the, your, your soul and your spirit and, and the, the, right, uh, the right brain. In Taoism they have a saying that they don't talk quite so much about enlightenment. What they do talk a lot about is becoming a fully whole integrated human being. Yeah. Fully integrated one meaning that uh, you're in harmony with yourself and all the aspects of your being, from physical to, to what we were talking about earlier, the karmic traces. And you're in harmony and integration with the big family of all living things and contributing back to that big family and as it contributes to you. And, a, and, and an attitude of respect, appreciation, and especially joy. If you ask a Taoist, what is the purpose of life? Invariably they will answer, to have a joyful life. Yeah. To really have a joyful life. And that doesn't mean go out and boozing it up, doing a lot of drugs. That means uh, healthy, balanced, integrated wholeness. The joy that comes from that. That's part of this as well, right? Active compassion. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah. We're resting in the radiance of the open heart. Yeah. But also, uh, probably you can tell a bit about cutting through it to clarity. Ah, that's <laughs> the one that usually is left out <laughs> in most systems. Uh, let's say you are on a good path, you've gone on a deep path, and you're becoming more and more integrated, and you're in more and more touch with what you feel to be your essence. Uh, you're doing good works in the world. You're making a difference. Feeling pretty good about yourself. Um, and you're feeling pretty blissful about all that. The danger at that point on the path, or the way, is that you become attached to being such a good, good person. That you, the bliss that comes from this goodness that you've accomplished actually becomes your final attachment. On the mm. path. And so at that point, it's very helpful to have a thunderbolt come and cut through all that stuff. In my case, I was very lucky. I was I just helped dedicate a sacred site in, uh, in New York State and came back to have a rest. And I was getting ready for bed and a lightning bolt came through the window and killed me for apparently six hours. Uh, which is impossible in terms of neurological survival, but somehow uh, it happened. I don't have any explanations for it. And uh, I know it the time frame because uh, it happened around midnight, close to midnight. And then I was shot through a tunnel into the clear light, a pure, pure being, pure consciousness, pure awareness and were kept there for what I found later was six hours. In that state, there's no time. But I know because when I came back through the tunnel, when I came back, reached birth, feet first, um, re-entered a human body, and at that point, um, the body kind of stabilized. I assume it was the same body, but you never know for sure. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but my eyes were still fixed on the light out of which I had come. And uh, that light began to, as the tunnel dissolved, what was left was this bright, shining light. And I realized at that moment I was looking at the morning star, Venus. Mm. 
And uh, that is often associated with uh, periods of great illumination in many of the great traditions on the planet. Um, Quetzalcoatl was considered the son of the morning star, for example. The Buddha had his enlightenment experience when he saw the morning star rise under the fig tree. So, uh, so it was about six hours that it passed. <clears throat> and that, uh, that cutting through moment revealed naked awareness, naked being. I was a pretty good guy. I'd helped to fight the environmental movement. Yeah. I'd done all these good things, you know. <laughs> I was still kind of attached to that. Yeah. Being such a good guy, you know. But but this is that story you have told. It can be small or big things that are cutting through. Yeah, cutting through can be something like a, uh, <clears throat> I had a cutting through moment one time meditating at our sacred land sanctuary in Crestone. And uh, I was in that state of real bliss and joy and kind of deep peace. And suddenly a red squirrel went off, sounded off. They like to defend their territory. And it went brrrr. And uh, it just kind of ripped through my, my, my senses, my sound sense. And everything kind of went, everything stopped. Mm. Stopped the world for a moment. Whereas I like to call it now, it stopped the world for an omen. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and in that space where perception in its normal way halted, in that space was revealed a kind of open, naked, pure beingness, pure awareness, pure consciousness. Yeah. So it's a very helpful principle. It can be provided sometimes by a human teacher who's well established in source. I've been lucky to have a few like that. And um, or it can come directly from the great mystery from nature itself. Yeah. 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 So and then I think also it's it's important to see where because I would like us to come down what we can do together. Sure. As a, as, a, as because it's also um, we are an, on a journey in this uh, physical form, all of us and. Uh, we have to, I mean, our ancestors has been struggling. It's not the first, we are not the first generation to, to face threats just to, to see that. And now we are connected on a broader scale through the globe. And we, we will not fix this if we don't do it together. Uh, but we have to do that for, from, from a clear source, of course. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? How can we connect and... Uh, uh, that is something that I think it's very important and you call it serve as a warrior of the open heart and probably you will yeah. comment on that a bit. Yeah, for that to really manifest it's helpful to go through. The sequence is more or less uh, chronological in terms of inner cultivation. So um, depending on where you're at, you move into this series of 12 principles and begin where you authentically are. Um, <clears throat> but in general, most of us uh, need to go back to the basics of really mastering relaxation, really becoming profoundly present and unifying the two. And through that, the heart naturally opens into a state of, of freedom and energy. And you begin to experience the life force flowing much more smoothly and authentically. And, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that was really what allowed the recovery from the stroke to be fairly comprehensive. And the path of energy is, is the path of energy, path of wisdom, path of the heart. And for many, the path of energy is is a good one because it it's free from the normal thoughts about spiritual cultivation. It's it's very pure. Mm. Uh, but path of wisdom, if it's a true, true path or the path of the heart are also very, very effective. But they all come together ultimately. Um, <clears throat> so as you accomplish deep relaxation and presence in the face of the shadows and the blockages and the obscurations, and the energy body becomes freed up, then you begin having experiences of the unconditionally loving heart that's at the essence of yourself. 
And you begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper into that path of energy and the experience of that is basically the joy of life. Mm. So the heart naturally opens. You don't make it happen, it's just there. It's realized. And then you enter into the challenge of not becoming too attached to that bliss of the open heart. But in the meantime, you often open up a path of natural compassion, which is the natural uh, kind of outward expression of the open heart. And so compassion activity, therefore, arises as the next step after the heart really opens. Mm. And um, <clears throat> when you get, we do a lot of Tonglen practice in the way of nature from Tibet. It's a pact, practice of active compassion. Uh, but it's done as a contemplative practice. Uh, Christianity is very good in act, what I call active compassion activity, where they actually do good in the world very consciously and bring great gifts. Uh, might be food or healing of different kinds, or but something that makes a concrete difference in the lives of people. And that comes from an authentic compassionate impulse which naturally arises from an open heart. But then again, the problem of becoming attached to the bliss of that becomes a challenge. So the cutting through principle, it's very helpful at that stage. Then once the experience of absolute pure source has been realized or tasted or experienced, you have something to return to. Then there's a, a seed of your true nature, your true self, your true beingness that is opened. And then the process is, is cultivation to simply return again and again and again to that natural state, of one's essential being. And do that often enough. I don't recommend long, deep periods of meditation nonstop. It's far more effective to apply contemplation many, many times during the day in the midst of, of activity and have that be a central focus for your life. So you return to that fundamental, natural, open, free, liberated awareness again and again in many different contexts with the outer world. Until finally it becomes more and more stable and then it begins to open into more and more inner spaciousness, more and more inner tranquility, more and more inner silence, more and more inner peace and those and that, that state of, of natural resting in source begins to be a reality. Wow. Yeah. And then the challenge is to bring that, to, to remain in that for as long as possible. And at that point is the process of just stabilizing the natural state of your <laughs> beingness. Yeah, that's the 13th. <laughs> In my country, we have these little uh, dog-like creatures called coyotes. And in the Native American way, they're like the joker in the deck, the trickster. And so you enjoy the paradox of the so-called liberated condition. The moment you think you like that, you, you've lost it. And so there's always that coyote or trickster in the deck good to have that basic humility about uh, the end result. <laughs>